Sorry. Uh, so welcome everyone to the grant workshop and I'm going to give you just a little primer for those who are new uh, to Motor Cities and give you an update on some of the general things that we've been working on. The Motor Cities National Heritage Area uh, is a place designated by the U.S. Congress um, to tell a, an important piece of America's history in our case our automotive and labor story here in southeast and central Michigan. We are just about 22 years old. We were founded in 1998 and are currently one of 55 national heritage areas around the corner who around the country who uh, tell that story. So we uh, talk about automotive and labor history here, but there's uh, varying topics around the country uh, from east to west and north to south and, and talk about different aspects of America's history, uh, particularly to that region like the steel industry in Pittsburgh or Abraham Lincoln in Springfield, Illinois and, and so forth. So uh, we are just one of those. Uh, again, we are an affiliate of the National Park Service, so we are supported by primarily by a grant from the NPS, and in fact, that is how we fund our grant program is through a National Park Service funding. So keep that in mind as we go through this, that, that every all the funds that we use to support our grant program are technically federal funds that are coming from the National Park Service. Our mission is uh, to preserve, interpret, and promote the region's rich automotive and labor heritage here, and we are also enabling, supporting, and respecting uh, this region's diversity, equity, and inclusion. And you see our founding partners there listed uh, to give you an idea of who's been supportive and, and in partnership with the heritage area from the beginning. But we really are a collective of the projects and the partners out there, again, some who are on the, uh, the uh, call today, uh, who've been with us since the very beginning, you know, whether you've just joined us last year or been there for 22 years, we are our partners. So we are just a small staff and a small office, but it really is our partners across the 10,000 square miles of the state that do so much of uh, the work. Um, you know, speaking of which, our, our entire footprint is broken up into what we call stewardship communities. And I'll give you this map to show you the footprint. This is 10,000 square miles of the state as far west as Kalamazoo, north to Saginaw, uh, south to Monroe, and sort of east in, uh, to Macomb County and even crossover into Windsor. So we're an international heritage area as well. Um, so just keep that in mind that we are these partners. Uh, this is them sort of in a listed format. So this is how we, we sort of divide up and, and bucket people into these areas. In theory, there's a concentration of activities around these places that uh, represent uh, the automotive heritage and automotive story of that area. But really some programs to touch on. Uh, we are story of the week every, every week. And in fact, just a few moments ago, you should have received the Motor Cities uh, You Ought to Know newsletter, which features our story of the week, as, as well as updates and information about things that are going on around the region to keep you up to date on Motor Cities, including an announcement of today's uh, Lunch and Learn. So uh, it's a valuable tool if you're not on board with it. Uh, we are our automotive events and, and automotive heritage uh, tourism. Uh, we calculate that over 6 million visitors across come to the region every year to visit some of our major events and attractions. And of course, this year uh, will be a slight dip in that curve, but it, we're also encouraged about the way people are planning for possible events this year and then obviously to return again next year. Uh, we are a national uh, passport stamp program. You see here pictured the new uh, 2020 passport guide. If you take a look at our Motor Cities website, uh, we have this new guide posted and this guides you around the sites in our heritage area that feature the NPS uh, stamp in the same way that you would if you were at a national park site, like uh, the Grand Canyon or Yellowstone Park. Uh, so this is a, you know, a huge connector between us and the National Park Service. Uh, wayside exhibit programs scattered across that 10,000 square miles. You see almost 300 of these interpretive signs that tell the story of the people and the places and the ideas that made this region great and uh, certainly, you know, help us to sort of make it more tangible to those residents and visitors alike who come upon the signs. You know, some projects, particularly we talked about labor, and this is a project we've been working on for some years. Uh, the 4th Street Bridge Park is a rendering of what the park was to look like. Uh, it's a spot between Detroit and Dearborn, sort of as you transition from Detroit to Dearborn near the Fort Rouge factory. It was the site of the 1932 Fort Hunger March, which is a famed sort of uh, labor moment um, in the early part of the labor movement, even predated the formation of UAW. We worked together with a, a, a myriad of uh, community constituents with the idea of building a park. And I'm just going to show you some images of where we are now from that rendering to some of the reality at the site as they continue to put the pieces together. Uh, and very soon we'll be able to open you know, this park up uh, most likely by the end of the summer. Uh, speaking of concepts of reality, we've also talked over the years about uh, signage that um, heralds the fact that you're in a national heritage area, that you are entering or in a heritage area. And uh, again, with a lot of hard work from a lot of great partners over the years, uh, we have now realized that. And in fact, there are 
uh, 14 of these signs installed all across the region. Uh, so you may run across them if you're coming in. This is one in particular, really valuable because it is positioned at the bridge in and out of Canada. So people are even entering the country, agree with a sign that says you're entering a heritage area. But these are in that Western outpost uh, in Kalamazoo and uh, Flint in the North and Lansing area, and of course in Detroit to let people know that you are in a very special place. And that allows you know more awareness of that as people travel through. It only draws more eyes to uh, the heritage area and your participation in it and your partnership uh, with your um, event. All in all, this, all of this that I just ran through and so much more, including what we'll talk about today with our grants constitute over $410 million of economic impact every year to our region. So this automotive heritage and, and tourism related to it is a huge driver in our economy and, and your partnership and your projects that you're proposing, you know, help to move that forward as, as you draw visitors to your sites, as you, you know, create awareness and bring in uh, others, you know, it just drives that up and it makes a huge impact uh, on those who visit, you know, to our local economy. You know, just want to put a plug in here that, uh, of course, you, and you'll hear as we are going through this that, um, you know, membership is is important driver here, and we would love to have you all become a member. So if you're interested in supporting this programming or, um, you know, being uh, continue to be involved in Motor Cities, uh, consider visiting our website, motorcities.org slash membership, or there's a way to, to donate directly uh, via PayPal, and I'll post the, both of those into the chat if you're interested in doing that as we go through uh, the program. But I want to get to what we all came here for, which is talk about our grant program. Uh, just to let you know that Motor Cities, essentially since the very beginning, has offered a grant program. We were founded in 1998, and almost immediately after, uh, we started offering some form of grant program to help support our partners, and that has not changed. And a lot of, a lot of questions were asked during this uh, these sort of tumultuous and, and uh, curious times as to whether or not we would be able to continue to support funding uh, for our grants. Uh, we can affirm, obviously, by the fact that we're having this uh, program here today, that our grant program will continue in its uh, format, and I'll talk about the formats, um, you know, in a moment, but our grant program will continue this year thanks to the understanding and, and the support of the National Park Service and that we presented to them, hey, our partners are the ones that need the help and the support, and we want to be able to assure them that they, we will be there for them. Uh, and so we are able to continue to offer our grants at, in the 2020 and 2021 format. For those who already received grants uh, this past year, uh, you are good to go uh, for this coming year. And for those who are applying for grants, we'll talk about that as we go through. Generally speaking, our grants uh, challenge grant program matches 20% of eligible expenses. Again, as I mentioned, funds come from the National Park Service, so keep that in mind. And it usually covers a, a calendar fiscal year, which is the federal fiscal year of October 1st through September 30th. So in your case, if you're applying for a new grant, it would have to be a project that happens between October 1st of this year and September 30th of 2021. As I mentioned, we started uh, almost after, right after we finished our general management plan, we started funding grants in 2002 and up to this year, we funded over $1.5 million in grants to 300 uh, different projects and partners leveraging uh, more than $5 million in additional support in the community. So you really are the drivers. And again, that's what contributes to those numbers. I mentioned earlier, our economic impact numbers is that you are leveraging these funds tremendously in your own community. So we want to keep up that good work and continue to be a part of that. We are certainly accountable for every dollar that goes in. We're just calculating that we're leveraging over $8 in the community. So between your support, your direct financial contributions, your job creation and your in-kind support, that's making a huge difference. All right, so let's talk about now our 2020 and 2021 uh, grants. Just a, a quick snapshot, and I'll get into details here, but two things to note. One is that the uh, 2020 uh, and 2021 grant cycle will include both mini grants, uh, which are grants that are up to $1,500 and do not require a match, and our challenge grants, which are Motor Cities uh, provides up to 20% uh, of your project expenses, and that, hence the name challenge. The challenge is for you to provide uh, support with uh, fundraising outside of that. So we're part of that puzzle, but we will continue to offer both of those grant projects. For the sake of brevity, I'm not going to go through the mini grant program because essentially everything that I go through in the challenge grant, the bigger grant program, is mirrored, if not compressed, in the mini grant program. So just assume that the basic information you're going to have to enter, some of the budgets and the representations you have to make are all necessary for the mini grants as well as the challenge grants. The challenge grants are the ones that are a little more extensive uh, and documentation-wise. So I'm not going to talk as much about that, but just assume that 
everything I talk about in the preliminary applies to both mini grants and uh, challenge grants. Also, uh, this year, our 2020 and 2021 focus, our areas will continue to be education. It was our theme this year, but because of uh, the, you know, the changes in the world that we've gone through, uh, we weren't able to stretch our, our legs as much as we wanted to on the education front. So we will continue in 2021 focusing on education projects as well as projects with exemplify diversity, equity, and inclusion goals. So if you have a project uh, and you work with an organization that supports that sort of thing, or, or if you yourself have a project that supports that, then we would like to hear from you as we're giving extra credit for projects that exemplify those goals and values and projects which allow virtual presentations. So one of the big things that we heard from our partners, those who are currently in grant awards, uh, is that they would, you know, as they come out of uh, the shutdown for COVID and try to readjust, they would really appreciate some help in simply pivoting some of their uh, presentations, some of their physical displays, some of their in-person activities that they will need to do maybe virtually because they can't gather people together because their historic sites or their facilities won't allow for social distancing or the proper security because they can't, you know, for instance, constantly clean valuable artifacts and, and, and keep them from being high touch uh, items. So they're coming up with a way to, to present them differently. So if your project is focused on your organization, your museum, your facility, adjusting to that, then we'd like to hear from you. And again, we would uh, be looking at some additional points for grant applications that deal with virtual presentation and that transition. So uh, keep that in mind as we go through. So first thing we want to do is make sure we um, determine your eligibility and those who are on the line today and those who will apply have to ask these questions. Are you a recognized nonprofit, government entity, educational institution in the heritage area? Uh, and we hope that you say yes. Again, the geography that I showed you is the footprint of the National Heritage Area. We provide uh, grants to support that per the National Park Service. So we can't provide grants to organizations who do not have projects in the footprint of the heritage area. Uh, the next question is, do you have a project designed to highlight the rich automotive and labor heritage of our region? And uh, we would hope that everyone would be answering yes to that and that we may have a project for a museum. Let's say you're a, a community historical museum that has a great project coming up. But if that project is not about that community's automotive or labor history and instead on another topic, then that's where it wouldn't be eligible for Motor Cities grants. So keep in mind that you want to be focusing on the automotive and labor history uh, first and foremost. Uh, do you have a timeline that fits into completion by 2021? Obviously, that is important as, as I mentioned that our deadline for completion here is September 30th of 2021. That is our federal uh, calendar, thus our funds from the National Park Service are tied into that. Uh, but we also want to uh, keep in mind that we can't go beyond that date. So we have to have a project that completes there. If you need to phase your project, for instance, and maybe you request funding for a phase of it, uh, that completes by that date, but you want to have a project that will complete there. And uh, ultimately, are you a member of the Motor Cities National Heritage Area? As I mentioned earlier, membership has its privileges. Take a look at that uh, link I posted in the chat. Uh, if you're not already familiar, if not already a member, uh, being a member of Motor Cities not only provides the privileges uh, there and sort of the, um, the cachet of being involved in it, but it also shows that you have a commitment and, and a sort of a skin in the game as being a partner in all of this. So we want to make sure that those who are coming in um, our members of Motor Cities National Heritage Area. So keep that in mind. With all that being said, if you check all of those, then you are eligible, hooray. So we are excited to have you as part of, uh, part of uh, our team and, and we're moving forward with our grant program. Just to give you the right up front, our grant applications will be online. It's an online application only and it will be posted to motorcities.org slash grants. So you can bookmark that page. If not, it's very easy to find on our website and then you go right on there you'll see a, a tab at the top called grants and programs and you know you go under grants and, and that'll lead you to both the um the challenge grant and the mini grants so if you have any questions about that that's where you'll find it on our website and our current current grant cycle it will start july 1st and it will end as in grant applications will be due by friday august 14th so though some who have submitted grants in the past uh you know may see that uh, schedule and see this it's slightly compressed from where we normally accept grants again that is to be aware of the fact that we need to get grants in we need to get grants reviewed they now need to and they're going to be approved by our board of directors and then uh, award letters will go out to you so you can get the work started by october 1st so we compress the grant timeline so that you are able to um, get the grant awards right away uh, russ did you uh, go ahead and unmute yourself 
Yeah, thanks, uh, Brian. I went online yesterday to find the application. I, I couldn't find it online. Right. We're, we're, the grant cycle starts July 1st, so that's when it'll be hosted and available. Oh, okay. So it won't even, it won't even be posted until... Right, right. Okay. That's, that's where you see the live link. All the, all the information about applying for grants are, are there, sort of the narrative and the detail. About right, I got that. Work. That was good. But yeah, yeah the actual application uh, will be posted beginning July 1st and will end okay. on August 14th. Okay. Uh, and I'll answer your question too, uh, Brenda. You asked a question about the labor portion. Could Eloise be considered uh, due to being in the city in its own and its own farms? And, you know, we want to talk about how it was impacted by automotive. So in the time frame of the way automotive history would be uh, represented there. So uh, if it fits into that time frame, for what I know of it, I'm not sure um, unless, unless there's a way to sort of bridge that gap. Uh, I'm not sure exactly how to tie in those, but We've heard we've heard very creative uh, projects that can put together that you know those, those connections and we'd be happy to consider it if, if it's one to do and and I'll encourage you as I will throughout this entire presentation if you've got ideas uh, feel free to reach out my contact information will be on there and if it's you know it's also on the website it's also on the grant application everywhere you're looking that you'll see grants you'll see my direct contact info so if you've got specific questions and, and ways that we can detail it out happy to talk to you uh, about all that but these are the general time frames of the grant. Uh, now we can get on to the moment that you've been waiting for, which is to talk about the forms. Let's talk about the, you know, the way that you're going to apply uh, and the forms uh, that you're going to see. So these are screen captures of the actual application as well, Russ. So what, what you'll see on our website is what you're seeing here uh, when you get started. So we, we, you'll be greeted with sort of this basic information. As I said, this will be same for mini grants and uh, challenge grants. So um, you know, this, this will be the same basic information to collect. Uh, project name, the start and end date. Remember that the end date has to happen between now and September 30th of 2021. Uh, is it involved in a National Historic Landmark? That's important, just, not just for us, but for the National Park Service, sort of keeping track of what's going on with those sites. Uh, your tax ID, which we'll talk about a little later, and the Motor City's mission area that it affects. We, we work in education, interpretation, heritage tourism, and revitalization. So your project will most likely fall into one of those three buckets uh, and we want to go with the one that best applies to it. So a lot of times museum exhibits are primarily education, though they do encourage tourism, sure. Or, or But if you're talking about work on a site, it's most likely revitalization, even though it will ultimately lead to uh, people visiting the site. So you have to decide where you best fit into those categories in that drop down. Also, some common questions as I look at you know this basic information. There's a spot there for the name and title of the authorized partner organization official. So this is the person who was authorized and designated authority to enter into grant agreements on behalf of the organization. Sometimes the organization, the there's a there's a grant writer, there's a fundraiser, there's someone who's writing the grant. But when it comes down to it, the person who can actually sign the grant agreement may be the executive director, or maybe the board chair, maybe a, a, a commissioner, maybe someone in a different position in your organization. So this needs to be the person who is actually um, designated authority to sign the, the grant agreement, uh, different from the person who's filling it out. Um, and that's who we'll address it to. For instance, if you were to receive an award, that person would receive the award letter to let them know that the grant has been awarded. Um, some common questions about the project contact. Who, this is the person that we would be in contact throughout the main project. So again, it may not be, uh, it may not be the person who filled the grant out, but it may be the person who is going to be on site for the project. The educational coordinator may be someone who's going to be uh, there throughout. This is the person that. Uh, Motor Cities, you know, most likely myself, would be reaching out to to sort of get project updates that I would be looking to hear from if there was some change uh, and some activity going on with the project. That would be the sort of way you would have to look at that. So we want this person to be the person who we would contact with questions. Uh, and then the fiscal contact. In some cases, this person is different from the person who is uh, both filling out the grant or authorized to sign it. Your organization may have a financial manager or a CFO or you know, might have to run through some other channels. We need to know who that person is so that if we were needing to reach out uh, for information uh, for specifically for finances, we know who to go to. All three of these people may be the same person, but in some cases, they're three different people. So we want to let you know that uh, you want to identify those people as you go through. This goes into the second part of the application, which is our cost summary. So this is where you would identify the cost for your project. Total project cost is the grand total for what you're going to do. If you're putting the roof on the building and it costs $100,000 and you're going to do it in the window of time we're talking about, that is your grand total. 
the eligible project costs are those activities or funds that um, meet eligibility. Uh, these, so you need to take away things that are fundraising, lobbying, food and entertainment costs. And I'll talk about those as we come up and say, okay, of that $100,000, did we have to spend any money on fundraising? Did we have to somehow lobby to get uh, clearance to put this, you know, change this historic site? You need to subtract those costs from your eligible costs. So if your project cost is 100,000, but 5,000 of that was for something that fits into one of these categories, you need to subtract that off. And then based on uh, that calculation, and again, we're talking about our challenge grant, you will be eligible for 20% of whatever the remainder is. So if you're 100% eligible, you have a $100,000 roof, you could apply for $20,000 to support that. And uh, that's the, the amount that you are requesting from Motor Cities, which means the other part is the $80,000 that you would be providing for the project that would be uh, coming out of your other fundraising and your, your uh, funds that you're supporting. So that is the application information. And yes, Anne, we will talk more about the matching requirements and sort of how you document all of that. So stay tuned. Uh, some common questions here, again, I talked about the difference between total project costs and total eligible costs. I just talked about that. Some projects will involve funds or activities that are not eligible for reimbursement. It should be identified and separated uh, we ask you that you you know look at these things and realize that we don't know every one of your projects and exactly how you arrived at this point but those are some of the common ones i mentioned that a lot of times there's fundraising and, and effort that goes into building up these projects that we can't support with the federal funding we can't use the federal funds to uh, fundraise we can't use in the lobby so we have to be careful of that also mention uh, food and entertainment costs those are subjective uh, and those are things that if it somehow is identified in your part in your project budget, then we'd have to identify it on a case by case basis as to whether or not those would be necessary. But what we're talking about is sort of uh, extraneous uh, sort of stuff like that. We did a, you know, we did a kickoff luncheon or, or we, we had a, a congratulatory dinner or, or something like that where it wasn't necessary to complete the project. Sometimes people have ideas where, hey, you know, at the end of the the project we we fed the volunteers and had a, a small pizza party or okay well then maybe we can talk about that if it's a small part of your budget but we don't want to have a huge extravagant um, um food related event be part of this because it's something that we'd rather see the funds focused on the uh, the completion of the project some examples of eligible costs so these are costs that are necessary to the completion of the grant project and outlined in your budget so before you submit you kind of want to identify this so of course, contractors and consultants, these are things, the direct costs of things that you're gonna to need to in order to pull your project off. Material costs and services are all uh, allowable costs. So, you know, whatever you need to buy in order to, to build that roof or raise that barn or whatever it is that you're doing, then those are all of the eligible, including the services to, uh, to do that work. Uh, staff hours dedicated to the project with documentation. So sometimes folks get tripped up with this and that if you are able to discern within a staff that you spent X a number of your 40 hour work week on the specific project that you've applied to Motor Cities for, and you are able to document that to us, you know, let, let's say it's a timesheet or some sort of other time tracking, Motor Cities has a time tracking program that we use. So we're able to extract that and say, we spent X number of hours on this project, then that would be acceptable. We can't take sort of general representations of it. Uh, we can't take, you know, so if we, we can't document it, we need to have the way that you can support it volunteer hours with dated and signed in timesheets. So whatever method that you use, a lot of your organizations use a tremendous amount of volunteer hours and it, it behooves you if you're not already doing it to come up with a way to track those volunteers. Maybe they arrive at the site and you have them sign in uh, on that date and time. It depends on how much work they're doing. You know, some folks I've seen where there's a specific, um, you know, date, you know, Dick Russell's on the line from Haven Hills, an example of tremendous amount of volunteer that might happen on a date in times so you may have a time sheet that a, a sheet that has the date at the top and a bunch of lines for all the individuals who come to volunteer that day and what time they came in and what time they came out so that'd be great if you use it that way some people do it where they have individual signing sheets where it says okay here's brian yop's volunteer sheet and then below that you've got the dates and times in which uh, brian might have come to the job site and worked yes nancy i was going to say um so this is for the grant but yes. these are things that all organizations should be doing anyways. So really, if you get into the habit of it, this is invaluable for so many different reasons. And yeah. understanding, you know, um, are you getting a good bang for your buck in terms of uh, what hours are being put into what gets produced and all of these other things. So don't think of it as an added chore. Think of it as something that your organization should be doing 
as a root on a routine basis and and it's uh, it's very helpful in many many ways sure yeah yeah thank you uh, i think that that's been the feedback from organizations who received grants in the past who maybe weren't doing it or, or just starting to do it they came back and said well this is really valuable to what we were trying to do because it allows us to track our time a lot more effectively and, and keep an idea of what it takes to pull these things off uh, and it also helps you with your reporting, your finances, and things like that. I had a conversation with one of our partners just the other day and, that, and brought that whole point up is that if you're getting volunteer hours and volunteer mileage, and if you're tracking it, and if there's any value to it, to post it as in-kind value and, and use it to support other fundraising, you know, it really is, is, really is important stuff. So volunteer mileage, the same thing. If you are tracking volunteer mileage uh, with supporting materials, including the date, start and destination and reason for the trip. So if someone's coming to your site uh, and they are doing it, you know, so they can come work on a project, then their mileage as well as their time is, is um, eligible to be tracked. So that'd, that'd be great to have both of those tracked. Uh, and then in-kind value of goods and services. So we'll talk more about that, but this is again with proper documentation. If you have an organization that is willing to you're going to work on windows and and that organization is willing to donate the windows to your uh, project then boy it'd be great if you got a letter from that organization that says you know we're abc window company we donated approximately twenty thousand dollars worth of windows uh to your site or you know for this project because that twenty thousand dollars is just as valuable as if you wrote them a check at least in our minds so we'd like to see that so with proper documentation so keep that in mind if you're soliciting in kind um donations and services that you want to document those Okay, ineligible costs. You know, we talked about that. These are incidental costs not directly associated with the project. They aren't necessary in order for you to pull off the project. And some examples, again, we also have to be careful funds from another federal funding source because we're funding from the National Park Service. We can't take funds from National Endowment of Humanities or, or any other source that has some federal money to it because then we'd be matching our federal funds with those federal funds and that's not allowed under uh, the um, Office of Management and Budget. So. If you have funds that are coming from another federal source, they need to be separated from what you use for us. Uh, activities that were perceived as fundraising, and again, this, this could be a slippery slope, but if you're inviting a potential funder to the site and you wanna show them the progress on the thing, but it costs money to bring them there or you're entertaining them, you know, these are costs that have to be extracted from this. A lot of times, you know, your executive director level person and maybe is the designated fundraiser, a lot of times their time, if they're using it for this purpose, has to be sort of separated from what you calculate is actual effort on the project because you, you gotta, we have to be careful on that. So we'll take a look at that as we go through. I mentioned food and beverage costs. If they are somehow germane and important to the project, if there's a youth group that you're working with and you say, you know, again, after we finish this project, we, you know, we took the students to uh, a luncheon, you know, maybe that's, that's allowable. We don't want to have, you know, because we had to have the volunteers come to the site, we fed them every time they came, well then we, we probably need to find another way to fund the volunteer lunches. Uh, if they have to, you know, if they have to be fed every time they come. General promotion of events, conferences, and et cetera. So this sort of deals with those who are looking for undercover sponsorship, you know, that we are looking for a tangible project, a project that has a beginning and an end, a project that has a deliverable when we get to the end of the line, not sort of just attaching our name to something. So, we, we you know, a project wouldn't be um, really uh, acceptable to our grant committee if it were just hey, we'll put the Motor City's logo on a, you know, a booklet, a magazine, a billboard. It, it needs to be tied into how you're going to use that project to present some education, uh, preservation, or tourism-related uh, uh, activity, but not just general promotion of event. Uh, conferences fall into that category. A lot of time a conference is looking for some general support uh, just to sponsor. And, and with that being said, if we slipped into the sponsorship, then that means we wouldn't know whether you're funding educational programming or having to buy coffee for everyone that's you know at the conference so we need to shy away from those sorts of costs um for general promotion and utilities and maintenance costs which cannot easily be identified so you know we, we can't accept here's the the dt energy bill the consumer's energy bill for the project because we had to use electricity to saw through the floor i mean that that is the sort of thing that is too general and too broad for us to be able to isolate with our grant if you were able to say that the electrician that came out to do this work was billed at this amount per hour, then you have a cost that is, you know, directly tied to the work that they did. But we can't take the general utilities and maintenance costs, um, you know, like water and electricity and gas and things like that. So that's ineligible costs. 
So let's talk now about the probably the most um, independent part of this is your project summary. Obviously, this would be different for every project. Uh, and so we can only give you general guidelines. But as we go through, feel free to post questions or raise your hand about questions you might have specifically. But this is the section that asks for that. Uh, within that, uh, you'll be evaluated on certain uh, program areas as far as relevance to the Motor City's mission and the capacity to execute the project. Do you have a sustainability plan for your organization or your project? So how is it going to be maintained and sustained after the fact? Of course, how is Motor City's recognized in the project? So because we're using federal funds and you know, money from the National Park Service, we need to make sure that there's some representation to the public that lets them know that. And, and again, that's particular to each one of your projects as to how you can best execute that. Some have physical properties where they can do something. Some have publications or programming where they can tout it. Some people are using you know, virtual things like supporting a website. Uh, Terry from the, the Pontiac Museum, for instance, we were able to support their website. So there's a, there's a recognition there. So a lot of examples of different ways that can be done. And this has to be sort of the best of your ability given your project. And at the end, performance measures. These are things that at the beginning of the project, you'll say, this is what we're going to do. And at the end of the project, you'll report on how you did it. So you know, that, that will be expected of your project. So again, this is the space. This is what it looks like on the, on the website as you enter it in. There'll be a space for a short summary paragraph, uh, 400 words to sort of be concise. This is your summary. And then as we go through the, the broader project description where you would want to include uh, things about the scope and the timeline and the budget and all those sorts of details in this, this space here. I highly recommend uh, another sort of best practice is that you prepare this offline. You prepare this in a separate document so that when it's time for you to import it into our form, there's no issue with the technology. You know, there's no accidental back button. There's no accidental delete. There's no, hey, I've been typing at this for an hour and a half and I just lost the whole thing. You know, take the document that you worked on separately and when it's time, just import it into uh, the form. And then uh, this is where you will be uploading things like your organizational plan or strategic plan. And it depends on your organization, depends on what you have, but we sort of, you know, couched it in these terms. You may have a business plan, you may have an organizational plan, maybe a master interpretive plan if you're working on something. Uh, but we want to see how what you're proposing you're going to do fits into your broader scope, your broader planning for your site. And, and over the years, we've had great success in working with uh, partners who were at different levels of incubation with their projects and having those plans sort of show that there is a light at the end of this tunnel, that there's a broader a roadmap of where they're going, not just, you know, taking uh, shots at the dark every year and asking for more. So we would ask you to upload that plan and then detail in this uh, box how you uh, have sustainability for your project. So if you're looking at something that's going to maintain over a longer period of time, how are you going to sustain it? Do you have additional funders? Do you have a, a mechanism for funding it? Is it going to be completely uh, visitor or, or user funded? So we want to see that in this, in this area here. Uh, and again, this section would be about how you're going to recognize Motor Cities as the final project. It may be a, a media announcement or an event, a celebration and physical signage on the site, so whatever plan that you have for how you're going to recognize, we'd like to see that here uh, and we'd like to tie it in. Of course, if there's a change to that plan, we'd like to hear from you and you know, know how it's going to be augmented. So let's talk about performance measures. This is one of those things that's subjective to each project, uh, but each project will need to identify and implement its measurements for the project using before and after comparison. So if you are doing preservation of an artifact or at a site, how are you going to, uh, you know, detail to us, you know, as the grantor and the general public who's seeing this, sort of the before and after effect? Where was this site, this project, this artifact before we started? Where is it afterwards? Uh, if, if you are in your grant proposal saying that we are installing a new exhibit and we expect to, to draw an additional 5,000 visitors per year because of this new installation, well then, uh, same thing, where, are you getting that data from? How would you be detailing that? You know, how are you going to identify that? And we would want to see that represented here. Or if you're educating children, you say we, we expect this project to, uh, you know, we expect this project to touch this many students in a year. Again, this year was a, was an odd one. We had many projects, especially focused on education, which proposed to bring a bunch of students for field trips or things like that. Well, who are you working with? How are you going to you know, sort of sustain that. Are you working with local public school or intermediate school district or, uh, you know, youth programs or how are you going to get uh, students involved in the project? Or if you've got a project where you say we're, pro we're producing uh, a booklet or, or a guide or historical something, how are you going to distribute those materials? So 
obviously distribution will be a big part of that. If you're going to create something, how are you going to get the word out there? So these are just examples of the sorts of things you would be detailing your performance measures and questions about how you would get it done. And let me not uh, miss this. So Terry uh, asked a question about any constraints uh, or objectives on how much Motor City funds capital related projects versus program related projects. So capital, you know, by capital, the only sort of real capital related projects we do are revitalization projects to um, to buildings. So we cannot be involved in the acquisition of a, of a property or, or um, both an artifact or a property. So in other words, there have been projects uh, which have come to us and said, well, we're you know, trying to start a museum. We're trying to build a, a museum. Uh, we cannot, because of our constraints with the federal funding, uh, put money into an organization or certainly not an individual, an organization acquiring a real property because that implies that we Motor Cities or we the National Park Service have some vested interest in that property. If we give you $20,000 to purchase a building, then that means we are part owner of a building, which is not the way that we, will, we can use federal funds. Same thing if we use money to purchase, uh, let's say, a, a vehicle. You know, many times that's come up where someone says, we want to display this historic vehicle at our site and we need to acquire it from someone who has it in, you know, in Idaho. Well, again, we can't use the funds to purchase the, the, um, the vehicle. We can maybe use the funds to transport the vehicle. We can use funds to restore the vehicle for display purposes, but we can't use the funds to uh, acquire it. So that's the limitation there. Uh, of course, we also know that the capital related funds is in work on a building exponentially more expensive. So, you know, there, there's no set ratio of how many uh, revitalization projects we fund. But I will tell you that the majority of the ones we fund as far as dollars and cents wise, the majority of the funding goes to those sorts of projects because they're the most expensive ones. So just by virtue of the, the heft of their application, a lot of times they're the most expensive projects. So I would say that, that if, if there's any tipping of the scale, that's it. Uh, yeah, thanks. I can guess my interest is going to be in revitalization. Yeah. Stuff. yeah. Sounds like it's all inbounds. Yep. And uh, Ryan, I think, you know, the, the example you've given about the, uh, the the Model T truck there in Westland is one that, you know, I think it's always been one that makes a lot of sense. Uh, what he's asking is could a, a possibly mini grant be used to renovate uh, the, the housing there to make sure it's appropriate, I think, to house that facility and, and create a display, interpretive display around it. Uh, yes, I think that would be a reasonable uh, use of the funds. Uh, again, we're not talking about installing new plumbing or rewiring, but we, I mean, it depends on what is needed. But we've certainly been involved in projects where we uh, created an environment for an artifact to, to live in, climate control, that sort of thing, where we needed to make sure that the space was properly equipped to house that, that, uh, that uh, artifact. So I don't know if that answers your question about that. Or bathrooms. Well, <laughs> Roger's on the line. We can talk about bathrooms, but uh, but that's the general piece about performance measures. And we can talk we can talk more about specifics uh, a little bit later. We're almost we're kind of rolling along here, making good time here. But this is the space where those performance measures would be identified. So all the things that I talked about, you would be listing those measurable outputs. So what are you going to produce for the funds that are coming into your projects? Uh, and they will vary on, on the project, but you need to identify them. And these are the things that we would expect you to then report on when you get done with the project. Uh, again, this is the measure methodology. So if you say you're going to measure the number of students involved, is it going to be through a website? Is it going to be a number of downloads? Is it going to be a number of people that come on a field trip? I mean, how are you going to measure the number of people involved in the thing? Or if you say you're going to measure attendance, you know, of course, you're going to say, well, we started this year and we had 10,000 annual attendees because we installed this exhibit. Our attendance is you know, risen to this level. Um, so we want to see how you're going to measure the thing that you are um, pointing out. And um, we, you know, we, we use this as an example, measurable output. So if someone says we tickets admission sold for attendance for a certain period of time, then the outcome would be long term, the total number of students who uh, visit the exhibit during that period of time would be sort of the outcome, the long term perspective of this project. What can you measure over a longer period of time? Uh, so this was an example. After the installation of a new Buick exhibit, the museum attendance will increase by 2,000 uh, visitors over the next quarter. So these are sort of the tools that you would go through to make sure that you're tracking that. Where did you start with? What did you end? And dates that you're measuring. Uh, an example for revitalization, uh, 
So the project will produce an operable architectural and engineering plan for historic property. Will you know end date sort of measurable output would be this plan will be produced by the end of this date. So the, the, the output would be the plan itself. So you want to look at it that way. And here it is tourism. You say, okay, the new Henry Ford and family tour will be delivered to 1,000 participants. Will the outcome be the number of participants who's taken the monthly tour? So we'll look at ticket sales through a period of time. The long-term outcome will be exit surveys from tour participants who may give you a pre and post evaluation of their understanding or appreciation for, let's say, Henry Ford, if that's your topic. So that way we know what's what. Uh, and before we dive into this one, this is a big one on budget. Let me make sure I catch uh, one of the questions here. Uh, so Phyllis, the International Institute of Metro Detroit is looking to support uh, to one preserve and refurbish international doll exhibit and produce a educational materials, identify catalogs and exhibit on holdings of cultural, uh, cultural artifacts. Which of these is uh, fundable? So keep in mind uh, what I said earlier about the need for the focus to be on automotive or labor heritage. So if there is a way to tie those things together, you know, if this is something that was produced uh, in, in conjunction with maybe automotive and labor history, but at first glance at that, I'm not sure if there's a direct connection to uh, the automotive and labor heritage that we uh, want to support. So we'd have to talk a little more about the fundability of uh, that project when we talk about the uh, refurbishing of the, um, the uh, doll exhibit. All right, let's talk about um, the budget. So on the website currently, there's a section called reporting. So these reports that I'm pointing to here are always available to click it uh, and take a look at. These are the same reports that you would submit at the end of your grant project. So anytime you want to familiarize with yourselves with them then, now, and during the project, uh, you can. So these are always there under reporting under the grants page. But uh, this is also what you'll see as you submit the application is there's a section here about reporting. And this is where you would upload the budget summary. So this is where the details about your budget, what you're going to spend, and where it's coming from would all be uploaded. And you would detail that here in a typical a budget format. So if you want to show your income and expenses or revenue and expenses, uh, along with time frames, or if you want to attach uh, details as to how you're coming up with that budget, then you could do it here. Uh, usually in Excel format, that's great because it allows you to manipulate the form. Uh, and this is, uh, we asked that question earlier about uh, the the match requirements and how you would detail that. This is where you would be showing, okay, we've got this much funding already available, and this is how we're going to match it. So your budget needs to be in, in proper proportion and ratio to what you presented earlier about what you're going to fund uh, from your side and what you're asking us to fund on the Motor City side. So this is that section where you'll be uploading that, but it's your own form of your budget summary, and this is where you would upload that file. Budget should allow uh, and show all elements of the project which lead to its completion. So if you submitted a budget, earlier our example was you're, you're putting the roof on the building, $100,000, then try to detail out how that $100,000 is going to be spent all in all. Uh, sometimes that budget is one contractor. Sometimes the contractor, you know, the, the roofer is a $100,000 contract. And hey, that'd be pretty simple. But if there's roofing and there's architecture and there's planning and there's all these other things that need to go into it, then try to separate that out so we can see easily what elements of the project you're asking to fund and what's reasonable and what's not. It's important to see that because our grant committee is you know, very well versed in this sort of thing and they are pretty good at picking that sort of thing out. They'll take a look at it and say, boy, it seems like the, uh, the electrical you know, uh, portion of this contract is pretty high or the material portion is pretty low for what they're trying to do. I wonder what's, you know, why this is so low. Are they, are they covering the entire roof or are they just doing part of the building? They're, they're pretty good at discerning that sort of thing and then they'll give feedback on that. So they want to see that budget detailed as much as possible with all these elements that you can, especially if we talk about staff hours, we need to see that. This is one of those things that can tip, tip topsy if we submit a thing where we say we're going to try to fund staff hours to this extent and then we get the final documentation back and it's weighted more heavily the other direction, we wonder what happened there. So we want to see where you're starting and where you're going with that. This is also where you would show that in-kind value uh, with documentation. So someone's going to donate to the project to this amount, you want to include that in your budget and represent it there. And these are additional support materials that are going to go along with the budget. So after you submit that budget, uh, you're going to need to uh, add these additional support materials. So one is uh, your IRS nonprofit determination letter. So this, of course, uh, uh, identifies that you are indeed a, of nonprofit status. We want to see that. Uh, we'll also be checking into your uh, status uh, as a Michigan 
uh, nonprofit. So we'll be checking with the uh, state uh, licenses and regulatory affairs just to make sure that your status as a nonprofit is uh, uh, indeed up to date. Your list of current board of directors, you should supply that as a nonprofit, those who govern your organization. Any letters of support, we, you, we would think that as you go into this, and especially if you're doing a project where you're getting financial support from others, that your letter of support uh, would be there, um, you know, would be there to uh, support your, your uh, proposal. So we want to see letters of support, at least one that supports the proposal, if not more. So this is where you could, you know, combine all of those and make an impressive application by combining your letters of support and any other materials. So if there's sometimes additional materials, some people have blueprints and you know other designs or renderings or things that they want to share with us that would add more uh, you know, illustrate more what they're going to get done uh, in their project. So these are all things that can be uploaded through the system there and they come directly to our emails uh, as a package. Uh, and then we can talk about now as we get ready to close out the reimbursement process. So if you're approved for the grant, that we are a reimbursement based uh, program. So you are asking us to reimburse the percentage uh, that you have applied for. So if you applied for $20,000 of your $100,000 roof project and you're ready to ask for that, then there's a reimbursement request form also on the website, also there all the time. You can download it whenever you need to and, and fill it out. And you would send it back uh, to me, actually. It comes directly to me with a request that says, well, Brian, we've spent $50,000 and we're requesting our 20%, which is 10 grand, and here's the backup for it. All requests for funding must be accompanied by that supporting document. So you would use the request for funding spreadsheet as a cover document, but then behind that needs to be the actual invoice the actual cancel check, the actual representation of whatever it is that you're asking uh, to be reimbursed. So obviously the evidence that you have indeed spent the money on the item that you're describing. Uh, and it depends on how it's done, but however you do that, uh, we wanna see that there. So it may be an invoice coupled with a cancel check. It may be a letter of donation, as I mentioned before about the in-kind. So you need to have, um, you know, you need to have that in place uh, to represent that in-kind donation. The letter needs to be from that organization, that individual who did the donating or the volunteer timesheet. So whatever it is that you're representing, we need to take it case by case. And for sure, if you send something in and there's, you know, there's any question about it, you'll hear from me uh, directly to say, hey, you know, we need a little more backup on this, or can you tell me what this, this item is? But those who are on the line that have received grants in the past can, you know, chime in as we get to the question and answer and let you know that this is not a, you know, it's not an onerous task. It's not a big undertaking. It's something that we just simply require to validate the fact that we're, you know, to expend federal funds on this, we want to make sure we have all the ducks in a row. So that's the way the reimbursement would work. And you know, giving you some specific examples of direct expenses need to be invoices from the vendor in its original form, so um, accompanied by the cancel check or evidence of payment. Some people use credit cards for payment or something like that, but something that supports the fact that you did in fact pay this person um, or this organization based on their invoice. Or if you're using employees' time, there needs to be some record of pay or timesheets that account for the employee's time, their rate of pay, and their tracking of their time for your project. So if you're saying they spent 20 hours on it, there should be a timesheet, there should be a punch in and out, there should be something that supports that. Uh, so you could say $20, you know, 20 hours times $20 an hour equals $400 that they spent on this project. In kind, there should be donor generated communication. Uh, which is dated that indicates that they made X contribution for Y project. Each one of these elements are important. Donor generated means it needs to be you know, on their letterhead or on their um, company you know, heading or, or, or an email that came directly from them, something that indicates that they generated. It's not your accounting of it. It is them stating the, 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 that the in-kind donation exact happened. It needs to be dated for the reason we said, which is that it needs to happen between um, the October 1st and September 30th. So we, we can't take a donation that happened today if you're applying for a grant that starts in October, nor can we take a donation that happens October 1st of 2021 if it should have happened September 30th. So it needs to be dated and it indicates that they made X contribution, whatever the amount is, to the project. So it needs to identify that they gave it to that project, you know, not just general uh, contribution, but gave it to the project. Uh, Nancy, yes. Yeah, so I was just gonna make a couple of comments. One thing is, is that, um, the, the in-kind contribution is really effective for the organizations because a lot of times in many grants, you're matching one dollar for one dollar, one actual dollar for another actual dollar. Uh, so this is something that's really good about Motor Cities projects. The other thing is, is, and I don't know, Brian, if you'd agree with me or not, but a really good tip would be 
if you generate in-kind um, numbers, it might be nice to have it um, maybe submit a little over, just in case some of the in-kind might be more questionable. That way it saves time in the administration and, uh, you know, and it also helps to show that you're really trying to do a lot more work than you're ex expected under the grant match. I don't sure. know what your comments are on that. Sure. Yeah, not. I, I think we always encourage, uh, I use the term overmatching, but turn in, you know, turn in what you have. I mean, if, if, you've, if you've chronicled it and you've kept up with it and got to this point, there's no reason to hold it back. You know, once, once you're ready to submit it, you might as well submit it and let us take a look at it. And if you overmatch, that's all the better because it shows that you had even a greater capacity to execute your project. It, it sets the tone maybe for future grant applications because if it says, well, boy, they were really productive in this project. They really got a lot done and leveraged a lot of extra volunteer hours or, or donations, even more than what they expected, that maybe future grants will be looked on more favorably because of uh, that sort of thing. So, no, that's great advice. Uh, same thing with in-kind volunteer timesheets or some form of tracking with the date, the time, and the purpose of their work. So not just, you know, I showed up here to sweep the floor, but I showed up here to work on this particular exhibit or this particular project as detailed here, uh, so that is detailed out there. So. Uh, that's what we'd be looking for as far as support documentation. When you are requesting reimbursement, uh, you get that. Uh, yes, Mr. Russell, are you waving? Brian, Brian, do you have a uh, volunteer hour rate that will be effective October 1st that we can uh, use budgeting? Yeah, we, we actually usually use the, um, the federal rate, uh, which is the uh, a site called Independent Sector. And it allows you to right. basically look it's, it up. Yeah, it's usually around twenty-four dollars and some yeah. cents an hour now. It's around yeah. around that right now. Yeah, it really is very uh, very generous. And when you think about that, it, it adds up pretty well. That when when you go in and you start looking at how much time your volunteers have, uh, you know, have spent on these things, it it really is quite generous. So I, I would say in default you use that as the value of time because uh, that is you know really really critical. So I think I'm gonna. Yeah, that's shown in the chat. I didn't realize it was up. Yeah, this is the uh, independent sector calculation. So right here, I think this is the national estimate, $25.43 per hour. So that's, you know, that's pretty good. So if you use, oh, there we go. Roger's all over it. You know, he knows exactly for sure. And he's, he's he and the Packer Proven Grounds have been an example of one who's used volunteer hours and leveraged those very, uh, very successfully. So it's a great example. So thanks, Roger. Uh, but yeah, volunteer hours are really valuable. If you can if you can track them, they're really quite valuable. All right, and then to close out, to close out this presentation, we're going to talk about the grant close out procedures. This is where if you are you can submit reimbursement requests along the way, but if you submit that final reimbursement, if you say the project's done, we spent all the money, we've satisfied the goals, now is the time to you for you to submit the final report as well. So those two links I pointed to that are on the site right now and will be sent to you with your grant. Uh, presentation. This is where you would, this is what they look like simply asking some questions about your project and how it's been done. Include the measurable outputs that you had already identified in your application. This is where you're going to report on them where these outputs achieved, why or why not. So you can go into detail there. Uh, provide a copy of the tools that you use to measure. So if you measured attendance, you know, how did you track it? If you measured number of students you, you know, you serviced, how did you, you know, come up with that? So give us a table, for instance, of, hey, we did 10 field trips and there were you know, 40 students per trip, you know, something like that. And then it goes into some other uh, questions about remaining involved in Motor Cities, you know, based on your experience with it. I'm sure it'll be favorable, but we want to get real feedback on, you know, how you are uh, getting on with Motor Cities as you get done with that project. So that's what the performance measure report is. Really, really short, simple, straight to the point. And you would upload any support uh, documents. This is where you would want to upload the images of how Motor Cities was recognized. So if there's a brochure, a document, an image of a of a, um, a, a plaque on the wall, a, a gold statue, whatever it is that you use to recognize Motor Cities, you would want to upload it here, uh, as well as any other additional support materials uh, that you want to put there. So this is going to be wide open, but this this is the entirety of it. So it's really straightforward and simple, nothing overly daunting, uh, but just want to give you that preview of the performance measure report. And that is that is the wrap. So as, as you close out your grant, you close out this presentation, and uh, you know, I want to let you know wanted to let you know everything that was there. And I uh, want to go back to the questions that were already posted. Uh, uh, Phyllis, thank you for the clarification about the cultural artifacts. And we can talk more about that. Uh, she was explaining that the cultural artifacts she was looking to preserve represent the culture 
in the diversity of people who were coming to this country to work in the auto industry. So that's, you know, an interesting tie and a great idea uh, maybe for how that could work. But we just would still want to see that you are highlighting that, saying that the reason you're doing that is because of the impact of these uh, these individuals and their work in the auto industry. Uh, so we really would want to see that shine through in your application. Uh, Cynthia asked the question, is there a diversity, equity, and inclusion component you are looking for in this grant? So, you know, we highlighted earlier that we are, the grant committee would be giving special credence to those projects who exemplify that. And then we're simply trying to broaden that, you know, the, the awareness, uh, and, and actually well before the most recent sort of uh, activities that, that uh, bubbled up regarding uh, racial uh, discrimination and, and consciousness about that, Motor Cities have been uh, focusing on a strategic plan to broad, more broadly represent those who are involved in the automobile industry, whether it's race, whether it's religion, creed, color, nationality, uh, sexual orientation, all these sorts of things to broaden that so that uh, the, the story is not always the same, the story that doesn't always have the same perspective. So we are looking for all forms of a more diverse uh, interpretation of this story. Maybe it is again, race and, race and ethnicity, maybe it is more stories about female influence on the auto industry. I mean, this is, you know, we're, we're trying to vary from the first sort of narrow focus that it has been uh, and broaden our perspective because we know that there are partners out there uh, who represent that. And we know that we're a huge state, uh, you know, 10,000 square miles even that we represent, that the stories are vast yet, you know, we're not getting enough to it. So we want to encourage people to become involved in that. And that's why we're saying we're giving extra credit to those a diversity uh, project. So if, if you have anything related to uh, those, you know, those goals that I mentioned, just feel free to share them. If we can do it a more offline, you know, and talk about whether it meets the goals. But I would say in a broad stroke, anything that broadens the focus and the effort behind telling our story, uh, I think fits those goals. So it's a great question. And it's something that we really want to work in our, there's a, a strategic planning committee of our board that really wants to make sure. Uh, yes, Don. Um, sorry, I had to find the, mute, the unmute button. I, I think a lot of the issues that, that I see around uh, Brian are museums, and, and I'm, I'm going to pick on Brian a little bit here with our local Westland Museum, is that they don't understand that there are so many ways to connect the auto industry to certain things that we've done. Uh, one of the things that uh, we just did was a uh, a beautiful Eloise uh, display. And although Eloise was a, a mental institute, a medical hospital, and, and many other things, there's a large connection to the auto industry there. Uh, Westland was the very first city that Henry Ford chose to uh, build his village industry in. Uh, it's still part of the Westland history. So I think a lot of it is you know, some of the projects that we do on a regular basis, we can always find a connection to the auto industry. And if we can't in Michigan, then there's something wrong. Yeah, that, that's usually the case. I mean, it's usually not that difficult for uh, folks to make that connection. And, and not to say that it's still, it will still be judged on its merit and, and the value of the, of the project, but it's not that difficult sometimes to make that connection. And even the example that, um, that Phyllis gave is a great way to exemplify sort of the cultural relevance of the auto industry. It's just that you have to, when you put the proposal together, you have to present it in that way. It can't just be we want to do a profile on these artifacts on so for instance these dials that were brought over without that rejoinder that says because of the uh the melting pot that was created by the auto industry and all the folks that came into it maybe they exemplify that and we've seen exhibits like that that were sort of the the elements so the influences the cultural stuff whether it was food whether it was music i mean there are great examples of projects that we've done in the past that tie those things together so um you know absolutely uh, other questions, and Michael, I saw your question in, in the chat, and we'll be, I'll be reaching out to you uh, individually to talk more about uh, your uh, previous grant application for the Oakland uh, County uh, Bicentennial. Uh, so, no, you have not been um, forgotten, I don't think, in that case. Uh, yes, Russ. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, on the mini grants, um, you had mentioned, I know we were talking earlier, uh, for the um, the regular grants, you need an organization that's been in existence for a number of years. Is that correct? Well, I mean, I, actually, we didn't, say, you know, we didn't say that there was a, a specific number of years in no. existence, but they absolutely need to be, you know, a, a recognized nonprofit in one of the categories that I mentioned. So 
educational institution or municipality or a 501c3 nonprofit. So they need to be recognized. Not a particular you know, thing about the number of years they've been in existence, but of course you would imagine that if an organization had just started up also applies for a brand and says, oh, we're going to do this, 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 that their capacity would be questioned, you know, by the grant committee as the Well, this, this is a, this would be a mini grant and it is a new uh, nonprofit organization mm -hmm. uh, in Northville. Okay. Uh, well, Ross, another, than, another situation might be uh, to alleviate some of that is uh, have hook up with a, a, a longer standing nonprofit mm -hmm. to work on the project. Well, yeah, the city actually, some of the people are going to be involved are, are uh, the city would actually qualify, wouldn't it? Yes, definitely. Yeah. That's a great example. I think if it's the project we've talked about in the past, yeah, I think, mm -hmm. you know, city or even the, the subsidiary of that, like a commission or something like that. Uh, yeah. And the Westland has a commission, for instance. So the city mm -hmm. you know, governs one part and you've got the commission that oversees the museum. Uh, but so it, I, may be a, it may be a brand new nonprofit that... Um, that partners with it's them. set up to do some things, you know, for the city, but kind of separate from the city government. Uh, yeah. Is that, I mean, is that a problem because it's new for a mini grant? Uh, we'd have to see. I think the bottom yeah. line, we'd, yeah. we'd have to look at the viability and, and ask those yeah. questions, which yeah. they presented the project and it's a, you know, moderate budget that seems reasonable. Yeah. And maybe there's a way to do that. But if there's something okay. that, you know, yeah. and it feels like it's, it's out of reach and it's a brand new organization, you probably will have yeah. a chance to get that done. The, um, the other thing is uh, on the uh, cost information uh, for a mini grant, uh, it's not nearly as, as complex, right? As no, it's usually pr pretty straightforward. I said the, yeah. the elements that I described, you, you still have to identify the organization and contact people and all of that. But the mini grant application is, is mostly uh, the short summary and the narrative of what you're going to do yeah. with the budget. You know, but so as far as the cost, um, uh, uh, eligible costs, ineligible costs, and so forth, and a lot of that may may not be such an issue with a mini grant. Uh, we would hope not, but no, the yeah. there is still that limitation, though. I mean, if the okay. person can't apply for, they yeah. can't receive a mini grant to do any yeah. of those things I described there, even if even. But if you're not dealing with percentages or anything. You're just dealing no. with a fixed amount. Yeah, it's still it's more direct. Mm -hmm. Yeah, obviously yeah. there's no match involved in it. So yeah, it would be more direct for sure. Uh, Ryan, but your they, question. Well, Oh, go ahead, Russ. Well, when is the next grant period after this? Uh, we're not sure. We'll have to see. Oh. Uh, if, if we remain on the same schedule, it would be start July of 2021 and okay. uh, October 1st of 2021. But uh, some things are up in the air, you know, political changes going on with election year. Uh, you know, so there are a lot of things to be sorted out. So we'll keep everyone posted on that, as we always do. And usually around this time, we would have a grant training. Uh, so stay tuned for that. I want to okay. uh, answer Ryan's question from the chat. The Westland Museum has a connection to the inner urban. Could a mini grant be used to create or enhance and display on that topic? That is, uh, you know, for sure. Absolutely, uh, Ryan. The, the uh, in fact, Northfield has been very successful with their historical society in doing inner urban related projects out there. Uh, and in fact, just finished one last year. So uh, I think so. That would be a great one to look at. Yeah. This is what we're saying. Yeah, it's a branch outside of sort of when we think automotive, you know, it's, it's not just. Uh, tinkering with a the car, there, there's a lot of impacts to the, the way automotive is, is uh, impacted things. In fact, uh, Joe Hines, who's been our designer for all of our Motor City's uh, wayside signs over all the years, uh, for those signs I showed you earlier, he, you know, when we started talking about the topics that we went through in the communities and the role that automotive played in that, you know, in creating recreation and creating the middle class and the labor force, I mean, there are so many different things you could look at. Uh, and, and the cultural elements of the roadside culture and, and roads themselves, you know, the impact of a road like a Michigan Avenue that goes through you know, Westland and stuff like that. So there are a lot of ideas that you can play around with. Uh, and in fact, we recently had a great project in Lansing that talked about the impact of uh, Interstate 496 and how it cut through Lansing and cut through uh, an African-American neighborhood there and the impact. So that's sort of an impact of automotive that was unintentional, but cut through a neighborhood created a whole different uh, whole different dynamic here. So just, you know, feel free to be broad in your, in your thoughts. Any other questions? I've, I've posted the dates, you know, again, the grant cycle ends, it's going to begin, I should put that there, it's going to begin July 1st, it's going to end August 14th, we hope to have awards announced by uh, October 1st, and these are all projects in ED completed by September 30th of 2021. 
Are we ready to wrap it up? First of all, a uh, big round of applause for Brian. He's done a wonderful job and very informative, Brian. So thank you very much. And uh, thanks to all of you too attending. I hope you found uh, all of this very instructive. I wanted to remind you as well that um, we will have another in the series of the Lunch and Learns this year, dealing with collections, preservation and surviving disasters. At this point, I would think that we are probably going to be doing the Zoom thing again, but we'll see. And so we would be breaking up our three presenters um, so we'll um, over three um, sessions, perhaps on a weekly basis. But uh, that's still a bit up in the air. So uh, as things progress, we'll uh, keep you updated on that as well. Uh, Brian, do you have any other comments to make? Or no, no. Thank, thank you all for your attention and, and following up. And feel free, you know, the, the contacts are there. Um, and I put it up on the screen and it's also on the website. So if you have any questions or thoughts or individual ideas of things you want to run by, uh, feel free to reach out. I'll be right here at this desk <laughs> looking at this screen like, like we have been doing for the last few months. I'll be right here. Waiting for you. Take care, everyone. We hope to uh, be in communication with you again soon. Thanks. Well done, Brian. Thank you. Thanks very much.